Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shannon Kepka from Comagine Health. I'd like to welcome you to our half hour hot topic series. These webinars are designed to support your efforts and provide you great ideas on caring for your residents in a 30 minute time frame to accommodate your busy schedules. They're brought to you by the Comagine teams from Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, Utah, and Washington. I'd like to say a special thank you for those of us uh, joining us today in the midst of everything that's happening with the COVID-19. We're here to support you during this challenging time and we will be recording and posting this session for those of your colleagues unable to attend today. So let's just do a couple of housekeeping details before we start. We are putting up a poll question for you to answer at your leisure while we do introductions. Please let us know who's on the webinar today by entering your name and facility in chat, as well as the names of any folks joining you so we have an accurate head count of participants. Your cameras and microphones are muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter it in chat and we will facilitate a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. And please make sure that you're chatting to all panelists and attendees. We are really excited about today's presenter on clinical pearls of transdermal fentanyl and other opioids, a pharmacist perspective. Uh, Dr. Rebecca DeMoss received her Bachelor of Science degree in biology and then a doctorate of pharmacy degree from the University of New Mexico. She completed a partial residency at the Raymond G. Murphy's Veterans Affair Medical Center, which led her path toward long-term care pharmacy. She has worked at Pharmerica Pharmacy since 2015 and after witnessing an increase in inappropriate prescribing of transdermal fentanyl, and in response to more than 16 near misses that would have led to sentinel events, Dr. DeMoss set out to create solutions. She has provided education directly to her healthcare team and presented a variety of statewide events to raise awareness of inappropriate prescribing patterns and promote safe medication practices. So I will now turn things over to Dr. DeMoss and let's just do a quick test audio with the group. Dr. DeMoss, can you say hello? Hello and good morning everyone or afternoon more like it. Wonderful, can somebody please do a chat and just let me know if you can hear Dr. DeMoss okay? Okay, I got a yes. So Dr. DeMoss, you may get started. Awesome, thank you. Well, once again, thank you again for attending this. I am so happy to be here. And yes, we're gonna be talking about some clinical pearls of transdermal fentanyl and other opiates. And it is a pharmacist perspective. However, preparing for this presentation, I did ask a lot of my consultant pharmacists, a lot of my nurses to get the best information to help you and your nursing staff. I wanted to pretty much try and give you the best perspective, just so you can feel empowered to be able to ask good questions, have the best information. So let's get started. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just a quick disclosures. I have no, dis no relationships to disclose, no conflicts of interest. I do have a disclaimer from Pharmerica that the views expressed in this presentation are my own and not those of Pharmerica, nor of any person or organization affiliated or doing business with Pharmerica. And once again, I am not an expert in the field of opiate prescribing or conversion. I am merely just a concerned community pharmacist wanting to share my knowledge and passion. So these are the objectives, and I won't go through all of them, but I think the most important is the first one of defining the initial criteria for use of transdermal fentanyl, and also to try and understand how to effectively manage a transdermal fentanyl overdose. So right into it, let's talk about the, some clinical pearls of the transdermal fentanyl. The first one is highlighted of absolutely to not cut these patches. And I know I've asked, been asked a few times about cutting patches. Specifically, I was asked about clonidine and, um, of course, transdermal fentanyl. But the only, we only have one patch that's available on the market right now that we can actually cut. And that's the lidoderm or the lidocaine 5% patch. Any other patch from the clonidine to nicotine to the transdermal fentanyl, we cannot cut. And once it is cut, you have that potential for all of the drug to become activated and then leak into the patient surface and then have an overdose. So definitely no cutting. The next pearl is to only prescribe this in opiate tolerant patients. So I want you to take a moment and think about your definition of opiate tolerance because we're gonna discuss this a little bit later. 
And then also to think about transdermal fentanyl, it's about 75 to 100 times more potent than oral morphine. So that's why it is so important for our patients to be considered and classified as opiate tolerant before we even start or initiate therapy for transdermal fentanyl. We also do not want to apply the patch directly to the site of pain. This one was brought up as a question of a patient that had a knee surgery and post knee surgery, that's where the bulk of their pain was and they wanted to apply the transdermal patch on the site of their knee. But the way that the patch is designed, it is only for um, the, the, the fat that is associated with the upper body of the back or the arm. Um, so any other place, you're not gonna get the same absorption or beneficial absorption. So that's where it's recommended. And I kind of mentioned that on four. So the chest, the back or the upper part of the arm, you're gonna get the most absorption because it really is lipophilic and it needs that type of um, fat and um, that those better areas to get the best absorption. We also wanna apply it to intact, non-irritated, or unshaved skin. So if, you know, the, all guys have hairy backs, right? So if we're trying to shave that area, that's gonna open up all those capillaries and you can get more absorption of the drug. So we wanna be really cautious if someone did have just shaved um, on where we're putting it in the best places. So also number five is caution when elevating our body temperature. This is kind of near and dear to my heart being a long-term care pharmacist because a lot of our patients like to use heating blankets or they take really, really hot showers. And the recommendation for that is just to monitor the patient. But as we elevate our body temperature, we can cause more and more and rapid absorption of the drug. So if you do find your patient that is all of a sudden they're utilizing the heating blanket a lot, you might wanna just observe your patient for that potential overdose. Some other pearls to remove the patch prior to the MRI procedures. So the current recommendation is if your patient is gonna to go to an MRI to remove the patch and keep it in a safe place. I know a lot of the patients use um, like a plastic baggie to, um, because you can still use the patch after the procedure. The reason why we have to remove it is some of these patches do have metallic components to it. So when they're in the MRI and the MRI begins, you're gonna cause a really bad burn. Um, and then also with appropriate disposal, ensure you're following your in-house protocol and document for destruction. I know um, there's been some really sad cases of the fentanyl patch falling off. And then the patient is not the family member or they have a kid that comes into the room and they find it and they touch the patch. So we do really want to make sure that we have good protocols in place. And I think the best recommendation is to fold that patch in half on itself. So the sticky ends touch, and then you can put it in a plastic bag and then give it to that consultant pharmacist. Or if you have questions on other ways of destroying it on a community setting, we can definitely discuss that. And we also want to have number seven is careful monitoring in our elderly, cachectic or dehabilitated patients. I want to specifically mention our cachectic patients. And since the fentanyl is so lipophilic, if we do not have enough fat to absorb that medication, you're not gonna get a good enough absorption and the patch is just not gonna be useful for that type of patient. So if you find that a physician may be increasing the patch, I know I had a patient go all the way up to 300 micrograms of the fentanyl patch. So that's three patches of the 100 micrograms. And so that I brought to the doctor's attention that well, if this patient is cachectic, they may not have enough body fat and they're just not absorbing the drug. So do keep that in the back of our minds. And with dehabilitated patients, um, debilitated patients, they might not be able to keep the patch on for those three days. And um, you're running the risk of them taking the patch off, you know, maybe putting it in their mouth. So that's another um, good pearl to remember when we're trying to see if a patient is a good candidate or not. And then number eight is caution when interpreting the fentanyl. So fentanyl is every three days. It has that 72 hour absorption. This is a recommendation from the ISMP that if the prescription is written as say 75 mics every 72 hours or 25 mics every 72 hours, 
there's been a lot of documentation that they've interpreted it as the 75 micrograms instead of every 72 hours. So the recommendation of ISMP is to no longer include the 72 hours because you're going to go into the directions, remove patch every three days um, instead of writing 72 hours. So if you're having a provider or you're seeing that kind of prescription, you might want to do your due, dil due diligence and ensure how it's written gets put into the MAR appropriately. And then just in terms of renal and hepatic impairment, I know that that's kind of a tough question on if what's their impairment, what's their creatinine clearance. But just to give you some guidance, if they do have moderate impairment, it is to decrease the dose by 50%. And if they have, if they have severe impairment, we're just not gonna use it. And then I believe the last clinical pearl is that we have some patients who may benefit from every 48 hour administration. And I want to give that just as information purposes only. However, we could fall victim to another inappropriate prescribing is if they start at every 48 hours, which is not correct. So the patients who benefit from every 48 hours are those who have failed every, every 72 hours or every three days. And so what we found in, in terms of our um, drug metabolizing is some people classify as rapid metabolizers or ultra rapid metabolizers. So for those particular patients, if you're seeing an increase in their breakthrough or PRN usage in that third day, maybe that might be a beneficial recommendation. But just have that in the back of their mind that if you do see someone coming in with every 48 hours, that is definitely a good question to verify. Did they fail the every 72 hours? Is this a new start fentanyl? Those are the kind of questions that may be beneficial to have an open discussion with the provider. So going back to that opiate naive question, I hope you guys thought of it, but this is the FDA's criteria for initiation of transdermal therapy. This is the opiate naive versus opiate tolerant. So they classify opiate tolerant of utilizing this below minimum morphine equivalents or MMEs for at least one week or longer. So I'm just going to mention the morphine 60 milligrams as kind of the hallmark of MME to start fentanyl. If your patient does not meet this and it has not been used this, has not been using any form of opiate for at least one week, your patient is considered opiate naive and they are not a candidate for transdermal fentanyl. So that's kind of how you can interpret this MME. So this is, I know this looks really busy, but I wanted to give this to you guys just as um, something that maybe you can print off and um, have hanging or just as a reference, but this is the current FDA table for the MMEs um, or the total, do total daily dose of each opiate. And it's the ranges of the milligrams and then very at the very bottom, that's the dose of the fentanyl patch. So just as information purposes, you can keep and um, have, have just in case you might need it. So just to kind of switch gears, I kind of talked about one inappropriate pattern, which is to prescribe the fentanyl for opiate naive patients. Just another quick prescribing pattern that I think the nursing staff can have a really big um, impact on is for coding allergies. And I wanted to touch on this because we are having a huge problem with incorrectly labeled patients with coding allergies. So what I believe is occurring is these patients are having an adverse drug event. So in terms of allergies, we can have a true allergy, a pseudo allergy, or an adverse drug event. And what's really interesting is according to a US pharmacist article that nine out of 10 patients labeled with an opiate allergy do not have a true allergy. It is, in, when, if you wanna go down to the ADE, it's about 30 to 60% of patients that use an opiate will develop the nausea, the vomiting, the constipation within um, the start of therapy, but they will get tolerance about five to 10 days. So because these patients, you know, 60% of people will have some sort of ADE, that's a lot. And what's happening is they want to label codeine or morphine or oxycodone as an allergy, but that's not appropriate. And what's also interesting is less than 2% of the U.S. population has a true IgE anaphylactic reaction to opiates. So I wanted to touch on this because if you have a patient that is labeled with a coding allergy, 
So this is just the class of the opiates. If you want to draw your eyes to that first graph, the first column of the phenytherins, this is all of the current opiates and the, their metabolites. So once a patient is labeled with a codeine, morphine, oxycodone allergy, that whole column is now you cannot use it in risk of fear for an allergy. So then if you go to the other columns, it lists the other potential opiates that can be used. But if you go through each column, there's a reason why we can't use it. Well, diphenoxalate and lopiramide, that's for diarrhea. The next column is fentanyl and mepiridine. You wouldn't use mepiridine because it has terrible, terrible side effects. The um, diphenylheptanes, methadone, propoxyphene is no longer on the market, but methadone has a whole slew of different pharmacokinetics, so that one probably is not the best. And then the next and final is brand name, oh, that's the generic for Nucenta, Tempetendol, and Tramadol. So if you're a provider, where are you going to gravitate to? You're going to gravitate towards fentanyl. And it comes in a patch to boot, right? So easy administration, it's extremely potent, and it doesn't affect anyone that has a true coding allergy. So this is why I highlight that if you can, as a team, discuss this with your patient and identify that it's a sensitivity instead of an allergy, you're going to decrease the potential that the physician's going to feel that they have to prescribe something different, and it's going to push them to prescribe more and more potent narcotics. So that's something that I've been working with my staff on if they do have a documented coding allergy, let's find this out, do our due diligence and ensure that it is a true allergy instead of a sensitivity. So just to go over, um, our Pain Relief Act was updated this past June. And I wanted to just quickly touch on it because I really feel that this, these form of updates are gonna be started um, nationwide. And what was the update is with any opiate prescription, basically, that's five days or greater, a co-prescription for naloxone is required now. Whether the patient picks it up, whether the patient uses it, that's a whole nother story. But in terms of our providers, in terms of our nursing homes, um, what we did as the pharmacy, all the nursing homes now have naloxone as floor stock, not only the injectable, but also the nasal atomizer. So we're trying to do our best in ensuring that every patient who has an opiate prescription gets naloxone. And like I said, I just wanted to highlight it because I kind of feel that this is gonna be something that we see start coming nationwide as updates in the Pain Relief Act. And um, just to touch on the transdermal fentanyl opiate um, reversal, I know I mentioned that that was kind of one of the most important um, that I feel of the objectives. And the reason why I wanted to touch on it is because it is a transdermal system. It's going to be in our fat deposits. So if a patient is given a high dose or they're also overdosing on their PRN, when you remove the patch, there's still a potential that that drug has created like a depot drug reservoir within our fat. And so what happens is it's almost like the cyclical overdose that we see that if you use naloxone, they're going to be revived momentarily, but you're going to see them go back into an overdose as more and more drug is released into their system. So if you wanna drag your, um, draw your eyes to the stars, it's basically if your patient's in a long-term care setting, well, if your patient is anywhere and they're having an acute overdose due to the transdermal patch, it's discharged to the ICU. And then they're gonna be put on a naloxone, continuous naloxone infusion to ensure that they are clear of the opiate and then to use a different strength of patch and monitor them appropriately. So let's talk about another um, opiate, morphine, that um, I had some just little bits of pieces on clinical pearls. So um, it is available in three different strengths. The most potent is the 20 milligram per one, or it's also known as the 100 per five, um, but easier to see it as 20 per one. We also have a 20 milligram per five ml, or that's four milligrams per ml. Um, and then we have the 10 milligram per five ml, which is two milligrams per ml. So I like to highlight that because when you're looking at different strengths or overall milligram, you can use these different formulations to see the volume that we want to use. So of course the most potent is the 20 per one. So if you need small increments like hospice patients or patients who are nonverbal or can't swallow, that's gonna be a better. If you don't want the full strength, you can use other 
options like the four milligrams or the two milligrams. I also wanted to highlight that some manufacturers are manufacturing this as a colorless and a colored liquid. I had a nursing home that was having just terrible times with measuring the quantity of morphine and then also measuring the pre-count and post um, dosage and just keeping good track of the overall quantity. And so we had the consultant pharmacist and the DON reach out to us. So now our personal pharmacy procedures for all liquid narcotics, we have to have a colored solution. So if you find yourself having that exact same problem, reach out to your pharmacy and have that open discussion. I know that like me, I'm the one who orders most of the narcotics. We will um, be able to do that for you. And I also recommend just doing a double verification of all the dosing and calculations on the prescriptions when administering. If it's the 20, 20 milligrams per one, 0.25 mils, this is extremely potent medication. We wanna make sure we're doing the best by our patient. And also considering the opiate naive and non-hospice patients, it is very potent, but when you're having a patient that is inappropriately prescribed transdermal fentanyl, this is my go-to recommendation because if they wanna try something in terms of identifying if they're opiate tolerant, you can use the oral roxanol and that will help you identify how many MMEs they're using per day to see if they can be a candidate of the transdermal system. We also want to have the appropriate oral syringes. We have the one mil syringes, we have three ml, five ml. Um, so if that's something that you're finding, you, you can't do a 0.25 mil utilizing the three mil syringes. So when we're talking to our nursing staff, giving the, the medication orally, make sure you're using your right syringe. And if you need different ones provided from the pharmacy, communicate that to them. And then also a diversion warning of some of these morphine solutions. So if you look at this picture, I know it's kind of hard to see, but the picture on the left is the correct color of what the morphine should look like. And it's at the 30 mil line. So this is a brand new bottle. And then if you look at the picture on the right, there's a, there's a color difference. And what occurred in this situation is nursing was a nurse was diverting the morphine, taking it out and replacing it with water. So you can see that the color difference has changed from darker to lighter. And unfortunately, um, this is an easy way for the nurses or any kind of staff to divert any kind of narcotic. So kind of reiterating to the nurses, once you get it, look at the color, identify what type of color it should be and consistent color. And if you do see it getting lighter and lighter, then you might be starting to get a little bit more suspicious. Some other um, opioid clinical pearls to never crush any extended release or sustained release product. I know if a patient does have a G-tube that it's kind of the go-to that you're gonna crush all their medications, but of course with an ER or an SR form, whether it's an opiate or any other formulation, once you crush it, you're gonna release that whole medication all at once and that could be dangerous. We also want to encourage patient and nursing understanding of the pain scale. I know I like to try and reiterate that because if you have a patient that wants to be completely pain-free, that might not be an option. And if they are completely pain-free, they're gonna be dead. <laughs> so to try to understand their pain and what is a legitimate pain level to get to utilizing opiates, that's gonna be the best conversation to have with your patient instead of going up and up and up in the opiate usage and then potentially increasing their risk for overdoses. And also another really good tip is when the patient or when the nurse is going from brand and generic. I know this is a common problem that we have. If the, patient, if the doctor writes for Percocet, they remove a hydrocodone. And what I always like to recommend with the nurses, if they have a brand name, that they need to double verify what the generic is before they're removing it from the e-kit or before they're administering it. And I know for like e-kits or the emergency kits, we try and do both brand and generic. If that's not happening at your facility or from the pharmacy, a great recommendation for the pharmacy to update and they should be willing to do that. And last but not least, verify all the required comment, um, components of the narcotic prescription. Sorry, that should be components. Um, and I wanted to just touch on this really quickly because as a nurse, you guys can stop this, the incorrect prescriptions to be transmitted to the pharmacy so easily. 
Just yesterday, we had a provider completely get a Roxanol prescription wrong. She wrote for Roxanol 0.25 milligrams per mil, which doesn't exist. And then she wrote 0.25 milligrams per one milligram, which you cannot do. She also sent us a prescription that wasn't signed. So if you're the nurse trying to care for your patient, you can go over, make sure that the date's written, make sure that the providers signed it, make sure there's a quantity, is it legible? So these are the things that we all can do as a team before it gets sent to the pharmacy, before the pharmacy then has to call the doctor and get things corrected, which is only gonna inhibit the patient getting their prescription. Um, and those are easy things that we can all do as a team. So I kind of like to end my um, presentations with a joke. Um, I saw this funny picture of the don't Narcan, I'm just napping. Um, and in the current light of the opiate epidemic, I kind of feel that there's places that really need the sign if they are going to be napping in their car. <clears throat> I actually heard a story of a woman who was in traffic and next to her, she's at a red light. This guy is just slumped over on the steering wheel. So she had her naloxone in her purse, got out of her car, administered the Narcan and saved his life right there in the parking lot, right there in the, the red light. Um, so, you know, the sign might be helpful in some places. And then um, if you are wanting more information about the transdermal fentanyl, I know we kind of went through it like lightning fast, but I did write a blog for um, the TLDR and it's a great reference. I've recommended it to many of my physicians as a desk reference, as everything they could ever want to know um, about prescri correctly prescribing transdermal fentanyl. So there's the um, how to look up the blog. And then if you are having a lot of opiate prescribing questions or your doctor's really curious and you find like this is an area of growth that you can do at your facility, um, Dr. Mary Lynn McPherson, she's an author for ASHP, which is the American Society of Health System Pharmacies. She wrote um, Demystifying Opioid Calculations and Conversions. It's an amazing reference. I actually bought them here today in case I got any questions. Um, it's, the, it's full of examples, the way she writes. It's just a, a very good reference if that's something you are interested in or being more um, educated on the topic. I highly recommend these books. And Ms. Shannon. Okay, so hi everybody. Wow, a lot of information in, in a short time period. I just wanted to take a moment while um, you are thinking about some questions and hopefully entering them in chat. I'd like to briefly tell you about our new Comagine Health Initiative. We're beginning a partnership to reimagine healthcare, working with providers across all care settings on issues like improving patient safety, increasing access to behavioral health, addressing opioid misuse, and improving care transitions by reducing admissions, readmissions, and emergency room visits. Providers who join the partnership will receive expert coaching and technical support, education and resources, and we'll have access to their performance measures via our brand new interactive data portal. And this is all at no cost to you. Joining is as easy as clicking on the link that I just put into chat to sign up, uh, putting your name into chat and saying, please give me a call um, or emailing me. And I put my email in there um, as well. So if you found benefit from our hot topics, prevention gems and having access to your performance reports, please go ahead and sign up with us. And we have some really wonderful questions already percolating in chat. So I'm going to get started in reading them off to Dr. DeMoss. Um, okay, so first question is, does the location of heat matter, such as if a person has a heated blanket on their lower body and their patch mm -hmm. on the shoulder, does that? that that's yeah. a really good question. And it's, it's overall body temperature. So if they're, you know, the term snug is a bug, if that heating blanket is so snug that they're going to have an overall elevated body temperature, that's where you're going to watch out for that potential. Um, I'm really not sure how often it occurs. I, it's a clinical pearl that Dr. McPherson had in her book. And I think it's just something worth notating if a patient is going to start using it just to have increased monitoring and be prepared to identify that's what's happening and maybe to use a different sort or maybe not have it tucked in so much and have it kind of um, laid out instead of increasing the overall body temperature to an un unsafe quantity. 
I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, how do you safely determine whether you have a sensitivity and not an allergy? So that's an open-ended questions with your patient. Um, I had an unfortunate individual who was given multiple doses of fentanyl in the hospital and they wanted to discharge him on the transdermal. He had that um, coding allergy. So what I did is open that conversation with the nurse and the patient. You have a documented allergy to coding. What happened? When did it happen? And uh, you go into depth. Was it nausea? Was it vomiting? And having those types of questions, that's going to give you a clear response. If you see that they had a rash, shortness of breath, those type of reactions could lead you to assume that it was a true allergy and to continue marking it as a true allergy versus a sensitivity. But it's really about opening that conversation with that patient and seeing if you can <clears throat> identify it. Um, there's been also times that I've discussed with the provider that, well, it's unknown. They had this allergy since they were 12 years old. Well, let's discuss it with the patient, see if they'd be willing to try one with, of course, the team there if he does have a reaction. But it's 2% in the population. So if it's that low, your chances are it's not a real allergy. And if you're looking at opiate naive patient versus not, Let's try something um, and be on the same page with open-ended questions and an open conversation with the patient, caregiver, and family. Great, thank you. Um, another comment, I've been taught that fentanyl is safe in renal dysfunction. Is there new evidence that it is not? Um, I'm not sure if there's new evidence, but that, was, that, that um, new edition was just published in 2019. So it's still a recommendation of the FDA um, and in terms of renal clearance, um, you do have that potential for the drug to be in our system longer because they're not being cleared through our renal system. So you could use that form of opiate in a renal dysfunction patient, patient, excuse me, patient if you have the appropriate monitoring in place. So I think that within that recommendation, is, it's just about monitoring. Should we use it? Is it the only thing that's working? Well, go ahead and try it but know that it could cause that overdose because you're not clearing it as fast. So it's, it's not a full on, um, you know, if, it has, if they have severe impairment and, and, you know, going even further, the FDA does not give us real recommendations of what they classify as severe impairment. There's no guidance on the creatinine clearance. So you're kind of using your best judgment. If the fentanyl patch is working and their renal clearance is decreasing, it's just about monitoring, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, another comment or question. I care for a patient with chronic pain who has been on long-term hydrocodone, one tab QID for several years. Would a transdermal fentanyl be a better option for her pain management? Oh man, you are like a person from my other life. I love that question. So I'm gonna go back to this um, graph. And the reason why I want to is because I wanna highlight the 12 microgram patch. Um, this is an off-label use. The FDA does not recommend initiating fentanyl 12 micrograms as a start of therapy. However, I've started calling hydrocodone the hydrocodone conundrum because at QID, depending on the strength, I'll start with, um, if you do five milligrams four times a day, that's four times five, that's 20 milligrams. So they're not necessarily a candidate yet. Um, I think the lowest I've personally gone is 30 milligrams. So that's a 5325 every four hours, um, which is six tablets a day, six times five, 30 milligrams. Um, and what I found is if you look at the benefits of potentially removing those four tablets or six tablets of hydrocodone and replacing it with the 12 micrograms, you're getting rid of Tylenol. And if they have a huge pill burden, they could remove those four to six tablets and then they can focus on their other comorbid conditions. So that's been an interesting practice change um, since I've been um, presenting on appropriate fentanyl use. Um, so that would be a wonderful conversation to have with the patient, have with the doctor. Um, I don't think they're there yet because like I said, my personal um, belief is to start at 30 to 59 of the 12 micrograms. Um, but that's, that's all a good question. If they remove those four tablets, that could be beneficial. 
And if they're already starting to have liver or renal, removing that Tylenol could be a beneficial move. Um, but once again, this is not FDA recommended. It is starting to become more and more practice. Dr. McPherson from ASHP does recommend the initiation of 12 micrograms. So it's definitely something that you can utilize, but once again, I always recommend open communication um, with the provider and with the patient. Make the best decision per patient per case. So good question, thank you. That's and all. We're gonna have one final, one final question here, which is, is it okay to cover the patch with Tegaderm to secure it? Yeah. And um, I have heard that a lot. And I think if you look at the safety around ensuring the patch stays where it is, that's what's gonna be very um, welcomed in the nursing home or um, in any sort of um, ri risk management and risk assessment, right? So yeah, no, great. And, this, and I've heard of that as the third day comes around, um, they start peeling off. Um, you know, there's lots of problems. So yeah, go ahead and use the tegaderm on the outside of the patch um, to safely secure it. Okay, so I'm gonna say that if we have other questions, uh, Dr. Damas has her email here and has graciously agreed to have folks um, reach out if there's some questions we didn't get to today. And in order to get you back to your day, I'm gonna just finish up with a couple of announcements, which is to encourage you to check out all of our posted webinars um, in our nursing home library, which is uh, um, into, the link was posted into chat and please share this with any of your colleagues who couldn't attend or use it to in-service staff. Uh, please join us for our next Hot Topics on April 17th for a presentation on care planning for suicidal threats, self-harming behaviors, and other urgent behavioral health concerns. Once again, I'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Rebecca DeMoss. Um, really, really great information, and we just love to have you, and hopefully maybe we can have you back sometime. So. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And everybody, this is the conclusion of Hot Topics. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a great weekend.